Hello there, and welcome uh, to uh, the East Midlands Young Whale Professionals webinar. Um, today we've got Andrew Allen of Aegis. Um, he's going to uh, give us a talk, as you can see, on level crossings. Um, I'd just like to let you know that you can ask questions in the chat panel. Um, there will be a time for questions at the end, and um, we will put those questions to Andrew as long as you put them in the chat panel. Um, nothing else from me. I hope you enjoy and I'll hand over to Andrew now. Thank you, Andrew. Right, uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, right, obviously, hopefully you're all here to talk about level crossings and I, I have an example level crossing here uh, from a Brio train set. Um, so hopefully we'll be learning a little bit more about those. Um, what we're going to talk about is suitable and sufficient risk assessment relating to level crossings. Uh, so what I'm going to explain to you is what is a level crossing, some different types of level crossing, different protection arrangements or not, a definition of suitable and sufficient in terms of risk assessments, uh, the Aegis risk assessment process, and then a little bit of a case study and some examples of different risks and things we've seen over the years at various level crossings. Um, and hopefully you can, all 96 of you can follow me all the way through. Um, so definitions, uh, the a level crossing is where a railway line crosses the road or right of way on the level, meaning without use of tunnel or bridge. That's the Office of Rail and Road, the ORR, the, the railway definition. That differs slightly from the dictionary definition, which is a level crossing is a place where a railway crosses the road. And that, yeah, the difference there is tunnel or bridge in the, or lack of tunnel or bridge in the ORR definition. So they've just refined it slightly. Um, in terms of numbers of level crossings, uh, Network Rail look after about 6,000 of the seven, seven and a half thousand crossings that there are in, in Great Britain. Um, the, the Network Rail are actively trying to manage those 6,000 they've got and they're reducing those um, all the time. Uh, the rest are located heritage railways, um, metro systems, etc. cetera, um, private railways. Uh, level crossings account for half of the catastrophic train accidents on British railways and the ORR believes that safe design management operation of, of level crossings can reduce these risks. The ORR differ a little bit from Network Rail because Network Rail have to implement um, the ORR are non, strictly non-for-profit where, uh, where Network Rail, the, the asset manager, have to look after that a little bit. Um, but Network Rail are aware that level crossings accounts for the, the it's the highest proportion of, of risk that they carry. So they are actively trying to manage and reduce risk at level crossings. Um, and that's why we look at them. And I, I've been looking at these for the last uh, seven or eight years because we don't want to be the driver of that car. Um, because the car, half a ton, ton versus a train, uh, there's only one winner. The train's going to mangle that car pretty badly. Um, luckily the people in this car got out, I'm not quite sure how, but they, they did. Um, this one we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on. So this is um, where a train came across the front, front end of a tractor, knocked that completely off. Again, the, the, the tractor driver got out and was, was completely fine, just bumps and bruises, um, no issues at all. Um, this was related to the, the law of unintended consequences around um, POGO gate, so power operated gate openers, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Um, the idea being a normal farm crossing like this involves five traverses of the railway. So if you're driving your tractor, you come up to the first gate, you get out, you open the gate, you cross over, first traverse, you open the second gate on the, on the far side, you come back, second traverse, get back in your tractor, drive across, third traverse, 
get out again, come back, close the first gate. So that's fourth traverse, and then come back over fifth traverse, close the second gate. The power operated gate was designed so you press a button on the side you're on and both gates open, you drive across one traverse and then you press a button on the on the far side and both gates close. The, the reason this accident happened was the time between getting him out of his tractor, pressing the button, getting back in his cab, he'd looked up and down the line and decided it was clear, pressed the button, the gates opened. And by the in that interim time, the train had come along and as he pushed it, the, the front of the tractor out, the train swiped it off. So the ORR are looking, or, or sorry, Network Rail are looking more closely in, in terms of um, pogo gates um, because they're not ideal. Um, it was thought they, they could be a solution, but obviously this accident show, shows they're not. Um, so there are different types of uh, level crossing. So occupation crossings was, provided where the railway crossed private road, and then accommodation crossings was provided where a new line split a piece of land in two. At private crossings, the user is responsible for its safe use. Um, both operate very similarly, but there are different legal standings um, for occupation crossings or accommodation crossings, uh, depending on which one it is. Um, Types of level crossing, we'll start with fairly simple manually controlled gates. So we've got pictures of Uffington and Barnock level crossing in Lincolnshire. Um, the, this particular one is normally closed to uh, road traffic. So you can see the gate here is uh, open to railway, closed to road traffic. Just off the shot here is a, a little cabin for the crossing keeper. When there are when there's there's road traffic wanting to use the level crossing, he will check that there's no train in section, and it, it is token token block, so he can only see that there's a train in section. He doesn't know where or which direction the train is going. He can just see there is a train in section or not. If there's no train, he will open the gates to the to road traffic and close them to rail traffic, um, allow road vehicles over, and then return the gates to the closed position or close to road traffic and then go back and make the signaler aware that it, the, the railway is close to road traffic and the rail and open to railway traffic. Uh, very simple, there aren't very many of these because they are reasonably expensive because you have to have a person there to man the crossings uh, while there, there's uh, rail travel, while there's trains running. The Next step, so that, that was how all crossings used to be. And then we got some technology, CCTV. So manually controlled barriers. You can see here there's CCTV masts. So this particular crossing, Maxi, um, near to Peterborough, is one of the longest crossings. So you can see the gates here, and then you can just see an orange person on there. That orange person is about halfway through the crossing. There's six lines of railway and it's 98 meters from one barrier to the other. So 100 meters, that's a long way to walk if you're on foot uh, with barriers open or, or um, barriers down and, and trains crossing. So how these work in previous ones, so manually control barriers, there was a person on site. These are controlled by CCTV. So the pictures are beamed back to the control center. So there's a signaler operating the trains over the six lines. They will get pictures of the crossing to say, yep, the crossing is clear of uh, pedestrians and road traffic. I can bring the barriers down. The problem with this particular one is because there are six lines, barrier downtime can sometimes be 45 minutes out of an hour, which then leads to when the barriers are open, drivers want to beat the lights and dash across. The next upgrade in terms of technology is um, obstacle detection. So MCB OD is the, the next step from a, a CCTV, which is this block here, which is affectionately known as, as the giant Tic Tac. Um, that's about a meter high, just, just shy of a meter high. Um, when the train's coming along, it will hit a treadle, will open that 
um, casing and there's uh, radar and lidar in there that scans the, the crossing surface for any obstacles if there's a vehicle there it will let the signaler know that the crossing isn't clear and the barriers have to remain closed and put the protecting signal down the down the line to red there are more and more of these being installed um, cctvs are being replaced by um, ods because there's less signaler in interaction and barrier downtime is marginally less for an obstacle detection crossing. Uh, so how they work, these slides I've um, blatantly stolen from uh, YouTube from um, Dad Rail, which as, as it said, it's, um, it's a, a dad explaining things about the railway aimed at kids. But actually, I'd advise you to go away and look at Dad Rail because he's got lots and lots of different subjects around the railway aimed at kids. So it's very simplistic. Um, oh, simplistic is the wrong word, but very clear illustrations of how the railway works. Um, really, really good YouTube channel. Um, so here we are. The, the railway signal is set at red. The train is stopped. Um, the road traffic light signals, RTLS, also known as wigwags, will turn orange and then red. Then the barriers descend once the CCTV clear is clear. So the signaler says, yep, the crossing is clear, all that yellow hashing, there's nothing sat on there. It's clear, it's safe to go. Barriers descend. The same thing with the obstacle detection, whether it's CCTV or obstacle detection, train still sat at a red signal. Then the red signal goes to green, train goes across, and then the barriers lift. Alternative types of crossing, we have um, an ABCL, which is an automatic barrier crossing locally mo monitored. And that, this is a picture of Marsh Lane, which is an ABCL. The locally monitored part is the train driver. So these are on lower speed uh, lines, usually single track, but not necessarily sing single track. Uh, in this particular case at Marsh Lane, the, the line speed here was 40 miles an hour, which a train moving at 40 miles an hour is still going fairly quickly. And if there's a vehicle sat on the crossing, I'm not sure the train will be able to stop. Um, again, not ideal. Network Rail are looking at um, automatic barrier crossings um, and locally monitored barrier crossings to try and try and remove them from the network. We have automatic open crossings and this is a picture here of an open crossing. This is at Barden Hills Quarry. So the name suggests that it's a quarry so they're in the business of selling rocks. Um, it's an open crossing, there's no barriers, the train comes comes along. The um, it's this particular one is um, train crew operated, or well, the TMO, the acronym, train man operated, is, is, is train crew. Train driver gets out, presses a button, the traffic lights turn to red. The train driver gets back in his cab and then drives the train across. So if you've got somebody impatient or someone hasn't seen the red traffic light, they could just drive straight, straight in front of a train as it trundles across. Again, the problem here is the, the name suggests it's a quarry, they're, they're selling rocks. You can get really long freight trains that are up to half a mile long, trundling across at low speed. That crossing could have a train on it for five minutes. So again, people try and beat the lights. They see, see the red light, but no train. They try and zip across. Again, not ideal. Automatic half barrier crossings. And these are the ones that are usually in the news when there's an accident at level crossings. These are half barrier. So the barrier here you can see is just a little stubby one, only descends down to the near side. So if you want to, you can weave around and make your way over the crossing. That's again, not a good idea when there's trains coming at line speed. In terms of the railway, the train driver here all of the sectional appendix and route, route cars and everything that the train driver sees 
they won't show this type of level crossing at all. They're designed so that the trains can go through at line speed without stopping, without any interaction at all. So line speed um, at Woodsford 37, line speed here is 90 miles an hour, but these exist all over the network at higher higher speeds. Um, so the, the train, again, these slides are stolen, acquired from Dad Rail. Train hits a treadle or an axle counter in the railway at the point at which the timings work. That will put the sig the uh, RTLS, the road traffic light signals, to red and lower the half barrier while the train is still approaching and train still going at line speed, so 90 miles an hour. We'll cross over, hit another treadle on the other side, which will then return the RTLS to green and raise the barriers. The reason these were introduced, mainly in the 60s, when road traffic was a lot lighter, it was to reduce the barrier downtime and to reduce the signaler interaction. So barrier downtime at these crossings is generally around 27 seconds. It's under 30 seconds for a manually controlled gate, whether it's CCTV or um, optical detection, that's usually just over a minute, some a minute 15 or so. So these were brought in to try and reduce that barrier downtime. Obviously, as traffic levels have increased and people have got more impatient, there are more and more instances of people weaving around the barriers and either hitting trains or getting hit by trains or near misses, etc. Network Rail are not particularly happy about this type of crossing. You they won't install any new ones of this type and they're actively trying to remove or upgrade the, the protection arrangements um, at these types of crossing. User work crossings, and I spoke about one earlier with a tractor that had the front end taken off. So user work crossings are operated by the user. So here we have one at Washstones. Uh, which is a user work crossing with miniature stop lights. So you can see in here that you've got a red, green, red and green light. So red means stop, green means go. There's a little telephone you can't quite see in there. So if there's no light showing, you're supposed to call the signaler to see what to do. There's a little panel there explaining what the lights mean and when it's safe to cross or not. There's increasing number of these crossings and they work in various ways. There are some that are fully integrated into the signaling system. There are others that are not integrated and just are standalone, that the train just hits a treadle and turns the, the lights to red um, to warn pedestrians that, that the train is coming. There are user work crossings with telephones or not. So this particular crossing here uh, called Pony, uh, the clues in the name, there's a lot of equestrian traffic over this crossing. There's no miniature stoplights. There's just a board up here saying stop, look, listen, beware of trains. There is a telephone here if you want to call the signal it, but there's no instructions. It's just stop, look, listen. So theoretically, this is a public bridleway. You could come along here riding your horse, open the gate, staying on horseback over the crossing opening the gates on the other side um, and away. You can see here that the um, horses using the crossing have worn away the, the, um, the tarmac on, on the, um, the approach. Again, not ideal, fairly steep embankment. Not a particularly good crossing when, when we went and looked at it. Moat farm number two, there are two crossings here. So first one here is this pedestrian crossing, so over the stile, into the railway owned and operated land, and then you've got your stop, look, listen board at the point where you need to look up and down the line. That's an issue because legally you've allowed someone onto network rail land without giving them a warning that trains are, are crossing. Um, there are several crossings like this where you can walk inside the railway boundary before getting any warning that there are trains coming. Obviously, the, the railway lines is a clue that train, trains are, are in, in the vicinity. Um, so that's, that's 
the first crossing. The second crossing here is this uh, farm gate with a different sign on the other side, which again says stop, look, listen. And then underneath there is um, a phone number to phone the signaler. So if you're a pedestrian, you come along, you look left and right and you make your own decision. Yep, I think it's safe to cross and you walk across. If you're in a farm vehicle using the farm crossing, you have to phone the signaler. However, that relies on the person driving the bit of machinery being able to read English and understand this sign. It relies on them having a phone in their pocket that is charged and they have signal. So again, not ideal. And the remote location of these, there's a number of these in, in the Welsh area that um, don't have phone coverage, although they're providing a phone number to call the signal out, people have complained that they can't always get through to the signaler. So again, not ideal. And that was the reason why we were, we were looking at that particular level crossing because Network Rail were aware there was an issue and wanted to um, get our advice on what to do. Um, East Road crossing is very interesting. So East Coast Main Line, so you've got overhead line at 25 kV. You've got four lines at 125 mile an hour lines railway you can't quite see behind the fence you've got plethora of signage all over the place explaining what to do and so instructions here check that green light shows yes it is fully raise both barriers so to raise the barrier you've got to use this hand pump here so you've got to get out of your car go and use that pump pump it up and down several times raise the barrier cross over on foot, do the same thing on the far side, raise the other barrier, come back, get back in your car, cross quickly, and then lower both barriers. So again, you've got to cross five times, as I explained earlier, to be able to cross the railway. Um, you can see the end end of that house there. There's a, there's a row of about six terrace houses, and this is their only access in. Uh, this crossing wasn't great when we were there and there was a slight hydraulic leak so the barriers didn't stay fully upright uh, when they were operated so they they had a, a slow creep downwards they they didn't go fully down but they just they didn't stay fully upright again that was the reason we were we were looking at this one not ideal particularly in poor weather conditions you're not going to want to get out and pump hand pump barriers to raise them um, the res residents of these um, terraced houses, we spoke to a couple of them on, on the day, they they were really not happy with, with this arrangement. Um, and I, th I think since we've been there, Network Rail have upgraded this crossing. Uh, user work crossings, power operated gates. Again, I spoke about the, this earlier. So these, this is an example, there are several different types of um, signage depending on whether there's a, a telephone provided just underneath the sign. So always telephone before crossing with vehicles or animals to find out if there's time to cross. Tell the crossing operator if the vehicle is slow or large, uh, sorry, is large or slow moving. If this is access, um, delivery drivers coming, farm access, harvest time, it can be busy. People are not inclined to close the gates after themselves every time. Also, if you're farming animals, you could be coming along with your um, Land Rover or whatever vehicle full of feed and the animals see you coming, very keen to come and get all their feed. You press the button on one side, open the gate and allow all the cows or sheep or whatever onto the railway. Again, not ideal. Uh, Network Rail, again, are looking at these types of crossings. Um, and I've just got a video. So hopefully you can see, this is us when we went to sites. So we've pressed the button, open the gate. So far, so good. Safe, safe to cross. Not safe to cross. So these aren't uh, interlocked with the railway system at all. It's simply a push button to operate the gates, um, which 
leads to misunderstanding with people who are unfamiliar with this type of crossing because they press the button, the gate opens and they assume that it's safe to cross. As that video illustrates quite nicely, it's not always safe to cross. Footpath and bridleway crossings. Again, there are many, many different types of crossings and different local arrangements. Uh, let me just get my pointer back. So Primrose up here on the right. Again, East Coast Main Line, 125 mile an hour lines. Uh, there's there's four tracks there. You can't quite see them all. There's no provision. There's just a sign saying stop, look, listen, beware of trains. It does give you an extra warning saying trains are going in excess of 100 miles an hour. But all there is to cross the railway there is just a little bit of raised ballast. There's nothing else. You sort of come out of a field, there's no railway boundary really, and you take your life in your hands on wet, slippy ballast. If you're not prepared, again, not ideal. Uh, Lincells on the left is a little bit better, so you've got quite a lot of palisade fencing protecting yourself, protecting the railway. We've got a red, red light, green light to tell us whether the train's coming. We've got a telephone that if we need to contact the signal, we can, and we've got a pedestrian gate opening away from the railway. So a much better arrangement than Primrose, which brings us on to Stoke Mandeville number four, which um, my colleague, Chris Beals, who I think is on this um, call, we went to today. This is one of the worst crossings. So sighting distance, the, out down to the right that you can't see is about 12 seconds. The path that you have to take, so you have to walk along the cess a couple of meters, cross over here, and then walk along the cess uh, 20 meters or so on the far side, and then up a similar path over there. So your position to get from one position of safety to the other position of safety, we uh, we timed using a stopwatch at 19 seconds, and we're uh, fit, young, well, healthy, understand the railway, know what's going on. If you're not particularly prepared, you don't know what's going to going on. That's going to take you a lot longer than 19 seconds. And the sighting distance, the point at which you see a train, is only 12 seconds. That was raised as a close call to network rail um, the moment we left site because that was not acceptable with the, the traverse time being more than the sighting time that's unacceptable um so network rail closed that the following day as a temporary closure and they, i think they they rearranged the um access on one side or other to make it a shorter traverse uh, to reduce to re remove the the um need to travel up the cess types of protection so this table comes from um the guidance notes for designers illustrates protected crossings and unprotected crossings. So protected crossings, manually control gates, because there's a person there that is talking to the signaler. Manually control gates with barriers, CCTV or obstacle detection. There is a protecting signal to stop the train. Again, ABCL, a AOCL, they are protected by the train driver and a, a train crew operated by the, the train crew. Unprotected crossings, automatic half barriers, we spoke about those, the, those that you tend to see in the news, people weaving round. User work crossings with miniature stop lights. So you, even if you've got a red green light, it's still unprotected. There is no railway signal to stop the train. And user work crossings with a telephone. So there have been a few instances of people calling up the signaler saying, I'm at X crossing, I want to cross, is it safe to do so? The signaler says, yes, it is, that's fine. And then they start to cross and see a train. That's signaler error. That's um, not a good situation. It comes from the fact there is no protecting signal for the, the, that type of crossing. And then there are others that are uh, line of sight, so open crossings or user works, um, footpaths and bridleways, which just rely on the user looking looking up and down the line. So what we do at Aegis is we uh, provide a service. We do suitable and sufficient risk assessments. 
suitable and sufficient is a, um, a term that I've been chasing a definition since I started doing this, um, however many years ago that was. The ORR don't fully define it. That is deliberate by the ORR. And I've spoken to several people at the ORR about this at length. The closest definition I can get is an off the record quote, and it's um, saying you really, really must take this seriously. The reason they don't define what suitable and sufficient is, is because they don't want people to then start following the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law and not thinking about taking level crossing risks um, seriously. The health and safety executive, which the ORR was a spin-off from many years ago, give us a little bit more of definition. This is what I tend to use as a guide. So um, not aimed at railways, but gives us a little bit more. So suitable and sufficient, a proper check was made. You've looked at it properly. And if Network Rail are getting us involved, then yes, they've done that. You asked who might be affected, so we do. We ask the railway and we ask local residents and, and people that might be affected. We deal with obvious significant risks, so we advise Network Rail on that. Precautions are reasonable and remaining risk, risk is low. And again, if Network Rail follow our recommendations, then we believe that's true. Uh, you involve your workers or the representat representatives. That doesn't really apply to the railway, but we do get the relevant people involved. And the level of detail in the risk assessment should be proportionate to the level of risk. Again, if we're involved, then Network Rail are taking it seriously. The process that we follow at Aegis, and there are a couple of competitors doing similar things that follow slightly different processes. Um, but what we do, and we've not had any reports knocked back from the ORR, um, so I think it works. So we'll do a um, pre-survey data, data capture, so a desk study where we look at maps and data sources as much as we can about a level crossing. We'll go out to site and have a look at it. We'll look at um, Alcrum analysis, which is a network rail program, all level crossing risk management toolkit. We'll come to that in a little bit more detail later. That's a, um, a tool that Network Rail own and operate. We do some cost benefit analysis on what the changes are, what, how much that's going to cost, whether that's proportionate or not. We have an optioneering workshop and get lots of people involved who know about the level crossing, how it's operated from different points of view. And then we package all of that up into a nice, neat report. Um, and then, so then the report has five main sections. So an intro and background, section two, description of site um, and hazards in its current situation. Section three will evaluate risks based on, loosely based on CSM principles. So we'll look at the, the current risks that are crossing um, and assign risk levels or um, risk and consequence, frequency and consequence. We'll, we'll do some optioneering cost benefits and then we'll get some conclusions and recommendations. And generally, Network Rail follow our recommendations as far as I'm aware. The things that we look at in the, the data capture, so we look at the level crossing order, which is the legal document saying a level crossing must have two barriers that raise and lower, like this one that I'm um, in front of you. We'll look at the asset condition as it stands. We'll look for any planning information or change to the railway. So if Network Rail want to increase the line speed or change the timetable to increase the number of trains running, all of those sorts of things change the risk at the crossing. If there's any planning information, so if there's a huge as the supermarket that's going to be built on the corner, that's going to affect the um, traffic flow over the crossing and affect the risk. So those are the sorts of reasons that we get involved. We look at the angle of the sun for both road approaches and rail approaches so that we know whether there's a risk of sun glare. We'll look at flood maps, schools, local amenities, what's going on, planning applications, um, railway data, sectional appendix, 
uh, many more many more sources of data whatever we can find out we'll we'll have a look at I'll just set this video going network rail also have a safety management information system SMIS database which is um, a database where they record any incidents that happen at a level crossing we'll look at those um, for the previous five years to see if there's a history so this video that we're watching at the moment is Matlock Bath footpath which uh, is a a holiday town in in the Midlands so when people are there this is the route from the train station you can see the platform up here and then along this footpath on the on the far side is a route to the Heights of Abraham cable cars which is one of the main attractions in Matlock Bath people are on holiday mode or day out mode they're not in railway safety mode and as you can see the video people are wandering up and down taking selfies checking out the railway not really concentrating um, and you can see sighting distance here behind the track so um, where the two girls are sat on the line if the train was to come up that that side that's nine seconds so I'm not 100% sure that if the train came they saw the train within nine seconds they'd be able to get up and get out of the way uh, so we we recommended to Network Rail that we close this crossing completely um, because of that reason. We'll look at um, traffic centres. So on a normal road crossing, um, so here we've got the road crossing. We'll get a traffic census company and we'll commission them to do um, traffic census. So at this particular crossing, Marsh Lane. We've got around about 3,000, just over 3,000 uh, vehicles and pedestrians each day, slightly less at the weekend, which gives us an idea of the level of risk and the, the type of crossing. There are some design criteria based on numbers. Um, so if you've got a very heavily used crossing, you can't have certain types of crossing protection. You need to um, follow those design um, guidance. We'll also do a speed sensor. So again, this is Marsh Lane. So I'm sure as you've been out and about driving around, you'll you'll have seen these um, things across the road. They give us average speeds and um, 85th percentile. So the the 85th percent of the highest speed that goes over that crossing here at Marsh Lane, it happened to be 24.4 miles an hour. That's uh, below the maximum permissible speed the, the speed limit in some cases that's quite a lot higher than the speed limit um, which gives us again another idea of, of the sorts of risks that, that can happen blocking back is something that we need to understand at a crossing so block there are different types of blocking back depending on where cars stop so red blocking back basically either a car is fouling the line completely or the back end of the car is fouling uh, the kinematic envelope of the train as it goes past so red blocking back is definite no no you can't have that um, and at this example that I've got here there's quite a lot of red one red two blocking back so recommendations to try and reduce that um, to, to zero amber blocking back can be within 11 meters for the, the lower level amber one again very high levels at, at this particular example there are various reasons for this. It could be there could be a right turn after the crossing or a T-junction, heavily used road traffic, rush hour, things happen. Um, not a good situation. So site surveys, Aegis will go to site, we'll take some photographs, we'll take a trundle wheel and we'll do some measurements. We follow the um, level crossing guide for managers, designers and operators. Um, affectionately known as publication number seven um, there's loads and loads of guidance that's a, a free document um, on the web available from the ORR um, or if you just just search for level crossings guide for managers you'll find it there's tons and tons of really useful information in there if you are interested in level crossings 
and here I've just got some pictures of the sorts of things that we see on site surveys. So here this is uh, Yaxley in Lincolnshire. We're on the top of about four or five metre embankment. We've got a crossing that is also skewing over a canal bridge. So there's a canal running underneath here and the crossing deck is skewed. There's a nice little step for you to trip up on. There's various different surfaces. This here is the sign saying stop, look, listen. Angled away from the, where the footpath's going. So again, not ideal. You've got slippy grass, uh, railway ballast, and then uh, wooden decking with some non-slip surface, which wasn't in particularly great order, all on a skew. Um, and again, 125 mile an hour trains with overhead line at 25 kV. This crossing is quite a common situation. So this crossing is uh, Frisbee uh, in Leicestershire. The roadway runs parallel to the road and then turns 90 degrees over the road at the crossing. So here you can see the bus to get the angle to, to come around the corner. The bus has had to take over both lanes of the road, which uh, increases the risk of a road traffic incident uh, or accident at the crossing. Uh, so again, not ideal. Down here, this illustrates um, issues that we have with certain types of crossing. So this is a sign for drivers of large or slow vehicles uh, must park here and use telephone at crossing. And then there's a definition of what is a large vehicle. You can't even see the crossing in the distance. So from this post to where that car is about it's about 100 meters and then another 100 meters and around the corner is the crossing so if you're a hgv large vehicle driver you're supposed to stop here walk down 200 meters use a telephone at the crossing say is it safe to cross walk back 200 meters get back in your vehicle start up drive off use the crossing and then stop on the other side and let the signal in know that you've traversed hgv drivers are usually on a time frame they're commercial drivers they're driving for a reason they don't stop at these these signs it's can be an issue at um level crossings because we know that that big vehicles in, are not stopping as they should do uh, again advanced warning signs for the level crossing you can't even see the level crossing saying it's just around the corner to the left there's a little sign there saying new road layout I don't particularly like that sign because what's new, who knows? If you're the first time there, it's a new road layout to you anyway. So that sign means nothing. If you're um, local, you'll know what the, the road layout is. You should be paying attention to it anyway. Um, and this is an example of what happens. So this uh, road traffic light has been clobbered by something spun around on the on the post and is now facing the, completely the wrong angle for approaching traffic so these are the sorts of issues that we come across and we let network rail know we've uh, we've seen so alcrum is a tool that network rail manage and they are very protective about who has access to it so even though we are level crossing risk assessment experts, we don't have access to Alcrum. The reason I think is because we'll, um, we'll tear it apart. We'll look at the algorithms and, and decide that it's not really fit for purpose. Anyway, um, how it works is it, it splits the risk into two parts. So there is a collective risk to the railway, so risks to the railway, and that's ranked one to 13. And there is an individual risk, risk to the user. So if you're driving a car over the crossing and that's ranked A to M and that helps evaluate uh, risks at crossings. So Brook, which is um, a case study that we'll come to shortly, uh, is, is there is an E3. Network Rail have worked quite hard over the, the past few years. There are no level one crossings at all remaining there are a small number of level two and by small i'm not sure exactly but it's 10 15 it's that that level of order considering network rail look after 6,000 crossings that's pretty good 
and then the reason we're involved with quite a lot of the crossings at the moment is we're looking at the, the next highest level which is level three so brook was one that, that um myself and chris bills were looking at <clears throat> what alcrum also does is it provides a an fwi a fatalities weighted index so that adds together the collective risk and the individual risk and it equates that to the value of preventing a fatality. So it gives a monetary equivalent of risk, how much risk there is at a, at a level crossing. It's a tricky concept to um, get your head around. What we do with Aegis is we look at that fatalities weighted index percentage of risk at the crossing and we equate that to the um the government issued um vpf the value of preventing a fatality or the cost of a life which 2018 that was 1.9 million that's 2019 which is the latest figures has gone up a little bit i think it's just just north of two million pounds uh we'll crunch some num numbers in the background and do some cost benefit so if, if the crossing is remaining open we'll claim 25 years because in 25 years time you've got to come and upgrade all your asset and and change everything because everything's um now dilapidated but for 50 years for closure so um you can claim longer one of the other tools we use is level crossing risk management toolkit which again if you're interested in level crossings go and have, go away and have a look at this it's it's a, a database of uh, generic risks and solutions at level crossing. So there's 150 or so um, generic risks um, and potential solutions um, to e each of those. Um, again, a really good bit of kit um, operated or um, by the R RSSB. Uh, we'll hold a workshop and yeah, I've got a picture of Star Wars people in there but it's, it's aimed to illustrate to get different knowledge about the level crossing different expertise um in there so we'll get a level crossing manager level crossing manager typically looks after 80 or so level crossings so they should know the details of the crossing we'll have someone that understands the signaling we'll have someone that understands the route area and how the railway is working and then anyone else that's um, going to have a valid input into the discussion so we can discuss all possibilities around what to do at level crossings. Um, so typical agenda, we'll review site photos. We'll Sometimes we'll have a workshop on site, so we'll go to the level crossings. We'll look at what the change to the railway is, if they're increasing traffic or line speed. We'll generate an options list which starting with closure and ending with do nothing. And we'll work down that list and come to an appropriate um, option. We'll look at all the information that we've gathered through the, the process and agree one or two options. So in terms of a case study for Brook, there were 3000 vehicles crossing in a day, very few pedestrians. What's that? That 17 or so. Uh, Alcrum numbers in there. This is a, a table kind of equating. So the safety benefits cost ratio along here, if that figure is above one, it's value for money and worth doing. So closing the crossing for a cost of 50,000 is a huge safety benefit to cost ratio. However, it's not practical to close the crossing, just put a gate across and turn the key. So Alcrum is a tool to be used, but it's not the only tool, which is slightly unfortunate because Network Rail, the output you get says risk assessment on the top. So a lot, a lot of people, not all, some people at Network Rail think, oh, I've got my Al Alcrum output, I've got my bit of paper, I've got my risk assessment. Not necessarily true. Uh, we'll look at the land ownership. So uh, this road is quite a steep downhill, so we're starting at the top of the hill, coming down the hill. This building here is a private house, but the person there is running a business and there's delivery drivers coming in and out. That's 
not a very um, that's not very far to the crossing from their drive. Uh, these are some of the issues. So it's chocolate box rural location, uh, very idyllic. People out for Sunday drives, looking at the scenery, not necessarily concentrating on level crossings. Uh, you can't see the crossing on the approach. Sun glare affects signs. Again, you can't always see the signs. We've got a sign there saying large and slow vehicles must stop here and use the telephone at the crossing. But again, you can't really see the crossing in the in the distance. You've got a risk of grounding sign, and you can see here the the verges are starting to encroach the road, making the roads narrower. So more likely to have a road traffic incident. Here you can't see the driveway of the business um, sticking out, but you can see where the gullies uh, have been eroded. And again here, you can't really see the, the driveway, but you can see how the road, road surface is being eroded um, by weather. Uh, you can just about make out the driveway to um, the business that has lots of delivery drivers uh, running in and out. You can see there's foliage covering the road traffic light signals. So again, on a bad weather or a really sunny day, sun glare, you might miss the signals. Currently, this is a half barrier, so people could weave around the barriers if they want to. Uh, this picture taken by my colleague, Chris Beals, who I, I know is on the call, is one of my favorite level crossing pictures. Um, that makes me... Uh, um, but it, it's good because it just shows the camber or the, the how the different levels at the crossing can affect. You can't even see under the car. You can't really see the front wheels of the car. So it shows what level of um, ground, risk of grounding there is um, at that particular crossing. Um, there is a telephone. So if you need to contact the signaler, so drivers of HGVs have stopped um, a long way down the line, down the road. They've walked up, they've used the, the crossing. However, that's again, that's inside the points that's closer to the railway than pedestrians should be standing if there should a train go by. So it's um, not in the best place. And the signage, it's kind of obscuring the signage. You can see the post there, network rail fence, fence post is stop, is blocking the view to some of that signage. Again, not ideal. There are some trespass guards to stop people trespassing. And you can just see here, there's a, a dog walker with a dog off the lead. Those trespass guards are aimed to try and stop dogs or animals running off down the line, which has happened at level crossings. Um, animals have gone careering off, owners have gone chasing them, and then the train comes along and splat. Again, not a good situation. So trespass guards uh, are present. This is on the other side. There's a phone there that looks like it could be used by the public. That's a signaling phone or a maintenance phone. And there is a perception in the public don't want to use telephones. They don't really understand the railway. They don't want to speak to a signaler. And particularly in COVID world that we live in at the moment, people don't want to touch things that they don't need to. So there is an issue around contacting signalers. Uh, you can see here on this picture on the right, a descent down to the crossing. There's a grip box there. It tells you there's an issue with ice in the winter. Again, sun glare, you can see shade across the road coming out into bright sunshine quite close to the crossing. So again, if you're not paying attention fully, you might miss the, the warning. Again, you can see verges being used as passing places and road surface not great. So this sign, risk of grounding, 100 yards from the crossing, that's there. This sign, drivers of slow, large or slow vehicles must stop here, 200 meters from the crossing. HGV drivers are not going to stop here, walk down a steep hill, call the signal out, walk back up the steep hill to get back in their vehicle. And again, further away still is the advance warning. That's the previous sign and 200 meters. So this is a long, long way from the crossing. Drivers of long vehicles park here. They're not going to stop. And that's what happens when they don't. So this uh, driver came down the hill, grounded on the crossing, but, uh, the um, 
Camber realise his error and then phone the signal out to say, help, uh, I'm blocking the railway. He he should have stopped, he should have walked down, but it's a commercial driver, he's on a time frame. Um, that's not, not always possible. Um, this caused quite a few delay minutes um, that were claimed back off this the um, the engineering firm uh, and removing that. So risks that we found at Brook were uh, sun glare misuse, so the, the grounding lorry, uh, incorrect road markings, the crossing approach, the um, steepness of it, risk of grounding, user familiarity with the crossing, either familiar or unfamiliar with delivery drivers going to the, the house, uh, visibility of signage with posts sticking in front and foliage, uh, road junctions very close, very rural, narrow road, roads, worn road markings. Our recommendation to Network Rails to change that from a half barrier crossing to an obstacle detection and uh, make good any uh, railway boundaries and damaged fences including local um, the crossing on a local gritting route for icy weather there is a grit box there already um, and an education campaign to the village so a letter drop with a, a leaflet to the residents of the village so that concludes what i have to say so hopefully you should understand what a level crossing is you should understand some different types of level crossing some different protection arrangements or not. Hopefully you should understand uh, suitable and sufficient uh, risk assessment process. And we've been through what Aegis risk assessment process is. Um, so if we've got any questions, then I'm just gonna leave this uh, video playing while I take questions. So this video again is at Matlock Bath. We watched a couple of people um, earlier taking selfies this group of people this goes on for about 10 minutes of um, people wandering up and down the line so I'll, I'll leave that playing but based on our risk assessment and our recommendations network rail did take on board uh, and in january 2018 they did close this crossing and have provided an alternative access um, to the heights of abraham over here Okay, ready for questions. Um, so the first one came from Peter. Um, he's he's asked at Pony. You mentioned that the user opens the gate whilst on horseback, then crosses. Does this mean the gate self close, or the user has to close the gate while they're still mounted? Um, it depends. At Pony, they are spring loaded, so they should self close. Um, but it depends on the uh, the crossing. There are, are other equestrian. Um, or bridleway crossings where the user has to close the crossing themselves and invariably they don't. Um, but at, at Pony they are spring loaded. Um, Ozan has asked, is there any type of level crossing that could be affected by an emergency speed restriction being imposed, um, i.e. since the train would travel at a much lower speed compared to the designed line speed? The effect of that is it's fail safe. So if the train is sl traveling slower than line speed, it will hit a treadle and the crossing barriers should descend and the road traffic lights go to red. The barriers will be down for longer, but that should be safe because the barriers are down and the road traffic lights are at red. The train passes at slower speed. So the, the only effect really is that the the barrier downtime is increased when there's a, a TSI in place. Mm -hmm. um, Dave has asked, have autonomous vehicles from either road or rail been considered yet? Not that I'm aware. And I, I have got a friend who's done a bit of work with autonomous vehicles and they, they are getting closer and closer to being um, widespread but I'm, I'm not aware of anything um, at the moment. <clears throat> Thank you. So Marek has asked, how much of a contributing factor is a ALCRM in your final decision 
for the proposal at the crossing, given that you said that the algorithms are not the best? Um, it's it's part of the risk assessment, and we always stress that it is only part of the risk assessment, and we we use it to help the um, monetary the or equating it to a monetary value. It we do use it. It it is a tool. It it is there. It it's part of, but we we tend to rely on the um, sound engineering judgment and and the the workshop and discussions around that the alcrum tool will give us a guide and kind of say you should be looking more at these options rather than these other options but if they're if they're not practical or they're impossible to engineer the solution or it's going to be ridiculously too expensive then that's where the, the skill of, of network rail engineers and and our, ourselves in our recommendations that that's that's kind of what we do. So it is a tool, we do use it, and it forms part of the risk assessment, but it is, it is heavily caveated that it, it's a guide, it's not the answer. Mm -hmm. um, Luke has asked, do locals ever fiercely oppose changes to their level crossing? Always. <laughs> um, again, this is, I struggle sometimes with how network rail approach level crossings so local to me there there is a level crossing and they've um wanted to put a footbridge in but the head the headline in all the local news is level crossing closure it, but if you're planning to put a footbridge in it's not closure because there's still a route from one side of the railway to the other yes you're removing the railway if they spun it in a different way of Look at all this benefit. We're gonna we're gonna give you a footbridge. Amazing. You don't have to go anywhere near the, the railway. Then locals might approach it in a different way. But there's there's always local op opposition to um, level crossing issues. But then I find I I speak to people and I'm independent and I I, I have a nice Aegis logo on. I don't have network rail, so I can speak to people a little bit more candidly and I don't have to toe the network rail party line. As soon as you explain the issues to people and they understand what's going on, then generally the public are understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so a question from James. Um, would running more trains or an increase in traffic always necessitate an upgrade to the protection and warning arrangements? Or is there more nuance based on what is reasonable and proportionate? Not always. But if it's a significant increase in either road traffic or rail traffic, then network rail have a duty of care to undertake a risk assessment for the level crossing. And it may be that the protection arrangements are suitable for the, the new level of traffic. So you can do nothing. But the, the duty of care is, is to undertake that risk assessment to understand what has changed. Mm -hmm. Um, so Maggie has asked, do you have any general comments on how the concepts you've discussed can apply to crossings purely used by emergency vehicles? In your opinion, do you think emergency vehicles should have control of the crossing rather than having to request access from the controllers? Very good question. Um, there are situations where... And that's why on traffic and I know there are protocols and things about getting emergency vehicles at over level crossings. And I, I, to be honest, I don't know how you resolve that. So, um, yeah, I, I can't fully afraid.
Hi, Andrew. I don't know whether it is just me. Um, I mean, if it is just me, then I'm going to look a little bit silly. But you, you have, um, you seem to have frozen. I don't know if you can still hear me. And I'm not particularly qualified to answer any of these questions. Oh, hello. I think I'm back. Oh. Yes. I didn't hear any personally of the previous answer. Um, and you, you didn't really dip back in either. You seem uh, to, be to back now. To which question? Sorry, to emergency services. It, yes, sorry about that. Uh, can you just repeat the question again? Sorry. Uh, do you have any general comments on how the concepts that you've discussed can apply to crossings purely used by emergency vehicles? In your opinion, do you think emergency vehicles should have control of the crossing rather than having to request access from the controllers? Um, I don't think emergency vehicles should have control of the crossings um, because tra stopping trains is a tricky business and stopping stopping railway running can have huge knock-on effects. There are protocols in place for emergency vehicles to use level crossings and the reason that the lights at level crossings are different is that the twin red light is all vehicles must stop including emergency vehicles I, th I think how it works at the moment is reasonable um i'm not an expert on emergency vehicles and i don't fully know that the the um the concepts on on that but but i think how it how the system works at the moment is is reasonable so isaac has asked what's your opinion on the new od mark ii technology that's being introduced at level crossings. Do you think that it'll improve safety at level crossings? Uh, it it will. So the the, the Mark II is better than the Mark One. It's more reliable. Um, it has um, better detection rates. So on where where it's where a Mark II has been installed uh, rather than the Mark One. Uh, yes, I'm not always confident that network rail have the, the decision to install an od crossing uh, an obstacle detection crossing in my opinion isn't always correct I, I sometimes think they they should think about how they deal with crossings um a little bit smarter um so the short answer is yes it will improve safety but in the long term, I think there are other things that Network Rail should be considering. Um, Ozan has asked, have you had to adjust assessments due to the change of usage due, during the COVID situation? Uh, no, we've had to uh, postpone assessments due to um, COVID. So we were due to go to uh, Cornwall to look at some crossings um, and to commission some traffic census to, to understand how heavily they're used. And that was due to happen um, early April. So obviously lockdown happens and we've had to postpone that, that crossing. Um, I'm talking to Network Rail at the moment and they're still not sure um, when the level of usage is going to be back to um, a, a level that that they think is is normal is likely to be next next summer before we we go is there anything as a follow-up to that is there anything that you can draw in the meanwhile i.e before usage has gone back to what it should have been previously uh, we can we can do quite a lot of the risk assessment um beforehand we can do all the death study and um and, and site survey and things um, beforehand. So we, we can get three quarters of the way through, get, get a lot of the background data, but without that traffic census data, that feeds into the Alcrum tool and also feeds in, gives you a picture of whether there's 20 people using it in a week or whether there's 2000 people or 20,000 people. You kind of need to know how, how many people are, are using a crossing in a, in a typical week to understand what risk levels there are. Mm -hmm. So a question from Thomas. 
Um, is there a hard and fast rule for undertaking the nine-day census surveys when considering potential modifications or alterations to level crossings? Is it acceptable to use, um, to, well, sorry, to undertake surveys at the most heavily high-used um, level crossings? And you and utilize ALCRM SMIS historical data to understand a more proportionate risk based assessment at other less used locations? The simple answer is that there's no hard and fast rule. However, the ORR are watching what we do. And as long as we justify what we're doing uh, suitably well, then you can do what you like the ORR are quite complimentary about what we do and we usually commission a, a traffic census um, we occasionally will use historical data or um, we might use a, a three-day survey or even um, a, a one day or a, 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 a straw poll type survey but we will caveat that caveat that in the reports and and extrapolate data and say this is what we discovered on this day for this length of time we think the crossing this crossing in the middle of nowhere that's got clearly not being used by very many people and we'll we'll work around that so it's it's proportionate to the level of risk at, at, the, at the crossing mm -hmm. um question from alex how, if at all, will the operation of level crossings be affected by future introduction of in-cab signalling? Uh, potentially quite a lot. Uh, depends how the signalling works, and how, and I know people are working on uh, on this at the moment. Uh, depending on what level, so. For example, a CCTV crossing where you've got a signaler sat in a, a, a signal box saying yes, the crossing is clear, pressing the button to allow the signal to go to green. Clearly, that's not going to be happening in the same way as it is at the moment with in-cab signaling. I'm I'm not a signaling signaling engineer, so I don't fully understand the the nuances of of, of that. Um, but yes, it, it will affect um, how level crossings operate. Thank you. Uh, do you think the railway will ever get to a stage in the future where there will be no level crossings on the network? That's from Helena. Eventually, yes, but not in my lifetime. So for, for instance, you cannot have a new level crossing. You, it, network rail won't allow you to have a new level crossing. So all of the, the um, HS2 and uh, East Coast Main Line, that's all, all new railway. Um, there are no level crossings on there. It's all either bridge or tunnel. Um, and the, the longer that goes on, the more network rail look to remove level crossings. And, and that's the reason we're, we're involved quite a lot is because they are trying to actively reduce level crossing risk. Um, I had one uh, one question that actually came in by email so if you just excuse me a second while i find it that's fine uh, so they asked um what would your advice be to anyone investigating a career in risk or risk management um within the rail industry in terms of the sort of knowledge and experience to gain and are there any resources beyond what you have shared today that may prove useful uh risk and railway risk is fascinating so yes um get involved do it um there are lots of things out there just an understanding of um what's a risk what a cause what a consequence um is common safety methods safety engineering all of those sorts of terms and things are are things that you, you can be be looking at um yeah, and, and the resources that I, I mentioned um, earlier in terms of specifically for level crossing risk um, are a good starting point. Mm -hmm. Well, we've um, we've quizzed you for the best part of half an hour. So um, thank you very, very much, Andrew, for having, uh, well, for a start done the talk and secondly, being 
very open for questions. Um, thank you to the um, attendees. I hope you've enjoyed it. And just a, a quick reminder that we we do publish these on um, the on the YRP website. So if you do, it, it will be available instantly. But if you do um, give it a check, hopefully within a few days' time, then uh, you can always revisit this if you want to. So thank you very, very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.